Hello, everybody. This is the program on constitutional government at Harvard in the Great Great Green Government Department. And our guest today is Scott Yenor. Scott Yenor is a professor at, uh, in the political science department at Boise State University. He is um, also a Washington fellow at the Claremont Institute Center for American Way of Life. That's in uh, Washington, Washington, D.C. And um, let me uh, tell you, he got a, uh, he graduated from the University of Wisconsin in Eau Claire, and then got his PhD, MA and PhD at Loyola University in Chicago. He is the author of uh, three books. One is uh, called Family Politics, The Idea of Marriage, which came out in 2011. Then he wrote a book on Hume, on David Hume's Humanity, 2016. And the one that uh, he's going to discuss today is a sequel to his book on family politics is called uh, The Recovery of Family Life. And I'll show it to you here today. And this is what he's going to be talking about, uh, an excellent book um, indeed. So um, with, uh, I think, no further introduction, uh, I think we can turn to David Yenor. He's going, he's going to talk for a while, Scott, and then we'll have Q&A. Scott Yenor. Scott <laughs> it's okay. I'm, I'm, it, I'm, like Scott David Hume. I'm like David Hume. Uh, yeah. I do things. So I, I, so, I, like, I, I consider it a compliment. Right. Um, <laughs> right, well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, th thanks for having me, uh, Professor Mansfield, and uh, thanks everyone for coming. Uh, uh, the, my book is kind of a long book and it has several different themes, and I'm going to take a cross section of the book today and talk about uh, feminism, and, uh, which is one of the main themes of the book. And what I want to talk about today is what uh, feminism presents itself as, uh, why it cannot ever be what it presents itself as and what feminism necessarily becomes as a result. So, uh, so first of all, why are we interested in feminism and uh, why do I emphasize it in this particular book? Well, there's, uh, I wanna say three reasons for that. The first is a strict policy reason, which is that uh, for 30, 40 years, conservatives have been trying to shore up family policy in order to encourage people to enter family life. And uh, nevertheless, the numbers and the experience of family life continue to decline over the course of time. And uh, one of the reasons for that, I would suggest, is that conservatives fritter around the edges on the policy and don't attack the source of the decline of family, which is both feminism and sexual liberation theories that are afoot in the country and shaping the way almost everyone tries to experience or manage their lives. So without taking on feminism and recognizing the way in which it creates a fatal circle within which we live, it's difficult to imagine a family policy ever being successful. The second reason uh, to turn to feminism is uh, kind of a bridge between my first book on the family and my second book. The first book tries to show how the idea of conquering nature has shaped family life over the course of modernity. It begins with John Locke and uh, on the moderns, it ends with, uh, with the great feminist thinker, Simone de Beauvoir. And uh, what I try to do in that is show how successively modern thinkers embrace the idea of conquering nature and, and uh, articulate an idea of marriage and family life that is consistent with conquering nature. That culminates in Beauvoir, which is in the late 50s. Uh, what, what this book tries to do is give an account of what happened afterward. What happens when an entire you know, polity or regime is aimed at conquering nature and, uh, and what happens specifically in this case to marriage and family life. So it's a working out of the principles of modernity that we see in feminism. And uh, I try to give an account of what that looks like today. And the third reason uh, is that uh, I think we're hit with a lot of cliches. The cliches uh, that we face and uh, as teachers, as uh, citizens, uh, come about when we ask, well, what do, what do women want? What do feminist women want? They will say things like they want equality. They want choices. They want to be fully human. 
Uh, they want to be all they can be. Now these cliches pass for analysis, but they ne we never get to the question of how would we know when we have equality? How would we know when we arrived at choice? How would we know when women are recognized as fully human? Uh, when is a choice a choice and conditioning conditioning? How would we know when we've achieved equality? These cliches that guide our thinking when it comes to feminism are at the heart of its project, but they don't get to its principles. And, uh, and what I've tried to do in the book is ask the early feminist thinkers, the revolutionary thinkers, how would we know when the feminist project the fully built out feminist project is complete. What would the world look like if you could wave your magic wand and give feminists all the things that they want? And uh, so I've interrogated uh, the early books uh, of both uh, of the French thinker and uh, the great American thinkers, Betty Friedan, Kate Millett, and uh, Shulamith Firestone on this question so that we could, so I could discover A, what feminism is, what it wants, and then B, how it is operating in the world today. So, uh, so I wanna to turn to that, which is the first part of my, uh, my talk, what does feminism want? What is the world that it wants to bring about? Now, I make a distinction in the book, and I think it's important for understanding how feminism works itself out in our lives to see a distinction between what I call radical feminism and what I call retail feminism. Radical feminism, is I would say the real McCoy, the real deal about what feminists are after. Retail feminism is how it is achieving those radical principles today. Often uh, we, we get distracted by reasonable enough goals uh, that today's feminists put forward, but don't recognize that they fit within a broader framework of the radical goals of feminism. So let's first talk about the radical goals of feminism and then talk about how they're working their way out on a retail level today. Uh, Kate Millett is my great source for, um, for the goals of feminism. I was looking for this uh, when I was working at Heritage and I will never forget turning to page 69 and 70 in her sexual politics. And she laid it all out there very systematically for us. She says, there are three goals for feminism. One, the first pillar, is to end what she calls patriarchal socialization. And what patriarchal socialization is, is any kind of socialization or teaching or education that encourages men to be different from women. So it's not simply playing with trucks for boys and playing with dolls for girls, but it's also the idea that someday boys will be fathers, someday girls will be mothers, Someday girls will be nurses, someday boys will be CEOs or mechanics. So we have to end any expectation of where men and women will end up in their lives uh, due to the way so society teaches us. So the first goal, the end of patriarchal socialization. Now today, we, we're ending patriarchal socialization, for instance, on our universities, there is a great uh, movement toward encouraging women into STEM. I'm guessing that nearly every university uh, around the country, it's certainly happening here in Idaho, has a women in engineering wi uh, uh, program or something like that. Women in science uh, at, uh, and engineering is what it's called here, WISE. Um, is its acronym and uh, and their special um, you know, recruiting efforts. But this is like this is a small thing, perhaps reasonable in itself, but it's contributing to the overall goal of ending the expectations of men and women having different jobs and making different choices over the course of their lives. So that's how it's working itself out today in retail uh, retail feminism. The second big pillar of feminism is the achievement of what uh, Millet calls um, uh, economic and emotional independence of women and children from the family. This means that women must not only have careers, but also have what we might say today, options. That is, uh, there is no expectation that they would be dependent on a man for either their provision or for love and community or for sex 
or for uh, like trust and intimacy. That is, if you get dependent on someone, you'll end up losing your full, your full humanity, which requires that you're independent. Also, Millet uh, is quite radical on this and says that uh, there must be an end to the expectation that children will be taken care of by a mother um, or, or for that matter, by a father. That is, women have to see that they don't have a duty to take care of the children that they produce if they're gonna be genuinely independent, emotionally and economically. That's the second pillar, um, the, the achievement of economic and emotional independence. Now that works itself out in our practice too. Today, and I assume this will happen over the course of the next administration that we have, there'll be uh, serious proposals in Congress to provide uh, national daycare. And this is part of the effort to achieve independence for women from the family so that they can achieve economic independence uh, in the workplace. So the proposal for national daycare is today's way of promoting the independence of women uh, emotional and economic. Um, it's the retail feminism serving the radical feminism. The third pillar of feminism, uh, as Millet gives an account of it, is the end to all sexual taboos. Now, what, what Millet had in mind there is the idea that our laws and our culture should channel sexual desire toward monogamous and procreative love. And uh, so the first step in emancipating that is, uh, is social acceptance for sex outside of marriage and for the use of contraception. And with the goal ultimately of teaching women that they can be uh, the initiators of sexual and, uh, and romantic endeavors. Um, and, uh, and, but then it has a lot of downstream effects too because uh, it's an embrace of homosexuality and she gives a long list of the things she would like to see the ta taboos removed from. Included in it are many things that uh, my students tell me they have to look up to see what they are. And uh, I'll let your imagination run wild uh, when it comes to that. So the big goal is to emancipate human sexuality from no expectations to what one sexual life would be like, or at least so they say, uh, that's the big radical goal. Now it works itself out in practice. Um, and I think probably the next, uh, the next uh, field on that is the, uh, is the expansion of what we mean by sex education in schools. Certain initiatives have passed in a couple of states uh, this past election that uh, endorsed the idea of pre-K through 12 sex education, and uh, uh, including one of our neighbor the neighboring states out here to Idaho in Washington has passed that. And uh, the idea is to teach children that there's, um, uh, there's no standard for sexual activity aside from consent and safety, but we're not gonna get there, so the law holds, unless we start you know, before <laughs> sixth grade, before fifth grade, we have to start in pre-K. And, um, and which you know, I think is kind of an amazing thing, but I think it is a retail policy that is really about uh, taking human beings beyond um, beyond repression uh, and beyond all sexual taboos. So uh, most of today's uh, reformers on these matters really don't think about the big picture. They think about the, uh, the, the, the attempt to, to accomplish today's goals today. And they make whatever arguments are necessary to uh, secure today's goals today. But they're all in the service of this larger project. Uh, this larger project of feminism, which is articulated in those three pillars. And uh, so without knowing it, they promote what I call in the book, a rolling revolution, a continual jostling of common life to try to achieve all three of these pillars um, to the extent that we can in our lives. The retail uh, feminists, they use the cliches. They say they want equality. They say they want to be fully human. They say they want choices. But the radical feminists show what all of those cliches serve in the, uh, in, in the here and now and, uh, and over the long haul. So uh, you have to see feminism as kind of like a uh, version of the modern project. 
where we have radical articulation of that project at the beginning, and then a lot of under laborers who are pursuing it over the course of time, some of whom are pretty self-conscious about why they're doing it, but not all of them. And, uh, but nevertheless, all of them are promoting the overarching goals of, of that particular uh, project. Same with feminism. Okay, so, so that's the first part of my talk. That's what feminism aims at. Uh, now let's talk about, uh, quite quickly, I hope, uh, why feminism can't achieve it. Now, I think a lot is at stake in this question because uh, feminism uh, puts forward this idea that we can remake the world according to our will. That is that human beings can be fully autonomous. We can be apart from socialization. We can be independent. We can have, we can have total control over our sexual uh, passions. And, uh, and, but is hum, human being that malleable? Is, uh, is the nature of woman and hence the nature of man so malleable that feminism could achieve all the things that it wants? And I think that we can criticize that view from both the top and the bottom. Uh, from the bottom, we can show that there are enduring sex differences that are persistent, universal, uh, and, uh, and I would say impossible to eradicate. Um, my favorite of these is always uh, talking about athletic differences between men and women, because no matter how much we try to cultivate uh, female uh, ath ath athletes, they lag quite a bit behind uh, male athletes. And I have even charts, if you can believe this, uh, in a book of political theory, comparing women world record holders in the 100 meter dash, you know, 100 yard freestyle and breaststroke to high school boys, uh, division three college athletes. And I think you could say that generally, uh, the world record holders in female sports would be very competitive each year in California high school athletics. Um, but you know they would win some years, they would not win some years. So that's like the number one woman of all time against 17 year old boys. And, uh, and that's about, uh, and that's a good battle most of the time, except in the shot put. For, for whatever reason, there's some East German ladies uh, in the late 80s who could really throw those shot puts. I don't know, I don't know that we wanna get into why that might've been, but, um, and they, they would just blow the boys out of the water. Um, so, but you know, athletic differences I think are there. And if you can't admit they're there, then you can't admit anything. If you can't admit those differences are persistent and enduring and traceable to the body and impossible to eradicate, then you can't admit anything. So I began my discussion of why human nature isn't so malleable with this treatment of uh, athletic differences between men and women. But then there are closely related psychological differences between men and women that I think we all know about and no one wrote better about this than uh, Professor Mansfield and manliness. Um, but here I go, I mean, I had to do the same thing. So here, <laughs> and, and um, for instance, women are agreeable more agreeable than men, and men are aggressive. Women are social, whereas men are generally more independent, or I think uh, what Professor Mansfield said in manliness, he called them abstract, uh, which means that they're not as engaged in the social life uh, as women are. Uh, you see this all the time. You know, uh, My wife and I were walking the other day and uh, two little kids on their training wheeled bikes drove by us. It's nice here in Boise. It's not like it is everywhere else. And um, and the girl looked up at us and was smiling and she ran into a pole. Whereas the boy paid no attention to us and was focused singularly on the sidewalk and he avoided everything and um, it made it through, but he wasn't very nice. I mean, the girl was just cute and nice. And these things start early and, um, and, and they're, you know, they're universal. We see it everywhere. Most crime is committed by men. Um, whereas women commit very few crimes. Most crime victims are men, whereas women are very infrequently crime victims, at least compared to men. And, um, and so I think this is a basis for saying that uh, there's these universal tendencies cannot be the result of some sort of worldwide universal and immemorial patriarchal conspiracy. So, uh, there's other things we could talk about in this uh, same way. We could talk about the role in reproduction and child rearing. We could talk about the role of uh, sexual desire plays. But this is just to say that there's something in us 
in men and women that make us different and that feminism, no matter how much it seeks to, cannot erase. We see this in so many different ways. Um, uh, the richer the country, the more different the choices men and, make, men and women make are. Uh, women in Sweden work part-time more than they do in, um, in like the United States in 1950 because they actually have freedom to do it. So in an atmosphere of freedom, we would expect men and women to choose somewhat differently and they do choose somewhat differently. So that's what I mean by saying that there are some things that feminism can't erase and, uh, and so we would expect differences between men and women to persist. Now let's talk about the other angle, what, I, what I'm calling for the purposes of this, the, the different, the, the things that limit feminism from above. And, uh, and that is this, that feminism compromises a lot of great human goods. For instance, and I think this is the most central uh, for the purposes of, uh, of understanding feminism, feminism compromises love. Love implies dependence. One person is dependent on another person. They, their identities grow together. And in fact, the love is a basis for a, a marital community. So love and community go together. Feminism demands independence, emotional and economic independence. It, de it demands a kind of sameness that human beings not only like are unlikely to manifest, but actually human beings don't want and shouldn't want because other things are actually more valuable than the achievement of autonomy. And one of those things is the love that a married couple has for one another and that they might have for their children. And none of that can be understood in the terms that feminism would have us understand them. So, um, so I think there are moral goods that uh, limit what feminism could do. So if feminism could re-engineer the human mind and it could re-engineer the human body and give us different dosages of estrogen and testosterone and, and make us very similar in muscle mass and in psychology, we still probably wouldn't want to achieve that because that sameness would compromise the goods of love and community that are pretty central to human being. So, so feminism can't achieve its goals and we shouldn't want it to achieve its goals. <laughs> which means that we have to be engaged in opposition to feminism. But now I wanna, uh, now I wanna turn to the third part of my talk, which is what, what the effectual truth of feminism is, what feminism means in practice. So here's why we turn to that. Uh, feminism isn't about equality or making women fully human or giving women choices. It's about creating a different kind of woman. If and, and, and what we need to do is articulate or identify what is different about this new kind of woman and what is different about the new kind of man that corresponds to the woman. Feminism isn't about giving women choices. It's about shaping how they choose and what they will be like given the new kind of education that they give, that, that they get, um, in these, uh, in in our new circumstance, so um, uh, it's a certain way of weighing the goods of life. That's what feminism is, not the achievement of transcendence. These aren't you know, the all right. So that's good. So so feminism provide destroys an old script, but it doesn't say that there's no script and you can choose. It gives us a new script. And this is where I think um, the, those who oppose feminism and wanna argue that it has a deleterious effect on the world and on the moral environment in which we live, I think need to focus their attention and articulating what the new woman is like and why she is less um, uh, happy uh, and, uh, and less the basis for genuine love and community. Okay. What was the old script that feminism destroyed? Let's just lay this out here quickly and, uh, and then I'll talk about the new script that feminism gives. Um, the old script was that both men and women for the most part were suited to marriage. That is marriage would be engaged in relatively young in life. Uh, it would be about growing up together 
and uh, managing the struggles that you have and going from the age of 20 to the age of 90 and uh, and and uh, and adjusting to one another but but being mothers fathers husbands wives and we would know what that would be in other words marriage was a kind of foundation for a life for most people and you can look at the stats uh, most people married uh, and in fact probably 100 years ago we would say most people stayed married and uh, with marriage as the foundation of a common life with another person. The new script I would submit is that it's good for human beings to be independent and that they should try to figure out how to manage the roles that they're gonna play uh, in a future marriage after they have achieved the important things in life, after they have achieved a career after they have established a kind of independence, both economically and emotion, emotionally, after they've uh, sowed their wild oats for a while, they can be more, uh, more ready to enter into a marriage they'll enter in later. But marriage will be a capstone that follows from individual achievement, not the basis for individual achievement. So this and I should say, and I'm also open to the idea that feminism says it's not a great idea to marry. Um, that is, why get why compromise any of your independence over the course of your life? Instead, why not uh, why not experience the joys of fulfilling work outside the home, and uh, and affect social change as an important part of your identity? So feminism brings forth. Like marriage goes down the list as far as the human goods go, uh, go, a new kind of marriage comes forth and less marriage comes forth. That's the new script. Okay, so the old idea of the foundational marriage is gone. The new idea of the uh, capstone marriage, as it's called in the literature, uh, comes forth. And I think that's the result of the, fe the new feminist script. And the effect of this new script on the world, I think, is different in different parts of the population, but I think it's palpable and important that we recognize. There are specific effects of this new idea of marriage on what we could call the lower class or Idaho America or Trump's America. And that is uh, there's very little uh, preparation uh, for boys or girls for married life. There's no expectation that men will be providers or less expectation that women will be domestic, there's a preparation for each for independence, but they lack both the examples and the preparation to get uh, to, to have successful marriages. And the result is a lot of lonely men and a lot of lonely women. And, uh, and once again, I, I, uh, I, I drive from here five hours north where my son goes to school and, uh, and that's the area in which you see the extreme family decline, where marriage rates uh, among those who are 30 are now less than half. Uh, divorce rates are very high. Um, and, uh, and so the, there's a destruction of marriage that has happened among the lower classes with this new script. But on the other hand, uh, there's, there's rather surprisingly healthy marriages in one manner of speaking, among the middle class and the upper middle class. I'll say that's where I live uh, here outside of Boise and Meridian where uh, it's, it's suburbia. And uh, in suburbia, we get a new kind of woman and a new kind of man and they can stay married and do stay married. They marry late, they marry after they've achieved uh, economic independence and emotional independence from one another. They have small families, but we have a new kind of woman who is suited to this new kind of marriage. In the book, I call the new, this new kind of woman, or I liken her to someone who checks boxes, um, who from, from her early moments of being raised as a young girl, uh, a mother oversees her preparation for uh, getting admitted into a prestigious school. And she'll start resume building and uh, engaging in community service actions and, uh, and uh, maybe getting internships and then honors colleges and then more internships. And then that internship leads to a low level job. And next thing you know, she could be a director of human resources at some sort of, um, sort of mid-level bureaucrat in a corporation. And, um, but that's 
what young, what middle class, upper middle class girls are educated toward. And as I say, they may marry, most of them still do marry. And when they do marry, they marry late, they have one or two children and they're very successful. And uh, the men and women look at themselves as best friends uh, or as life partners in that way. Uh, they exchange roles uh, quite freely and, um, and, but that new kind of marriage, as I say, that's the capstone, is uh, less fruitful and less central to their identity uh, as they go through life. So this new script has had the predictable effects. It has taken marriage down a few levels as far as how important it is for human beings. And it has, um, it has led to fewer marriages and the marriages uh, are less enduring um, over the course of time. And when we see the, the, the new generation arising, uh, we see, I think, even more fruits of this. Uh, at least some statistics suggest that uh, girls right now who are under 30, uh, only one in four will have children. And, uh, and more than one in two will not marry. Like, that's pretty astounding when you look at it historically. And uh, now we'll have to see if those predictions uh, wave, uh, are, are true, but it's a new script that's leading to a new kind of marriage and a new kind of woman. Um, now, I would suggest that, that there needs to be art on this. Um, are the, is the new kind of woman happy? Is the new kind of man happy? Um, there are some scientific studies, and I've written about this on the American mind in an article called The False Science of Feminism, that suggests that women uh, under modern conditions, that is where feminism reigns the most, are less happy, more suicidal, and more uh, medicated than women in pre-civilized countries, uh, or I should say non-feminist countries are today. Uh, I just, in fact, had to review an article on this uh, that was a survey of the literature um, and, uh, and ar argued, held the same thing uh, based on sur uh, surveys of happiness. And uh, so there are some indications that feminism isn't responding to the needs that most women articulate. And, uh, and as a result, uh, they may be freer, they may be more independent, but they're less happy. Uh, and I think, you know, we, we could give the same kind of survey to men. Uh, men are less changeable uh, by these circumstances and by their nature, I think. But I think we could probably judge that men have less ambition and initiative um, than they did uh, two generations ago because there's less expectations that they will provide and fewer expectations um, that they would lead uh, in family life. So, so feminism provides a new script that provides a new way of life for us that ends up not responding as well as the old way to a full range of human needs. What should we do about it? I'm gonna go very quickly here um, uh, about what we should do about it and just say a couple things. Um, uh, what I describe in the book uh, and, and my friend who's on the call here, Jennifer Bryson would not let me use the word moderate feminism. And uh, so I coined a new word that I'm desperate and it's pitiful but it's better than moderate feminism. Uh, and that is womanism, uh, which has a little bit of theological baggage, but at least it's based in biology. So I feel better about womanism. And, uh, and, and this is the general philosophy that I suggest should guide um, those who would like to restore family policy and family life and uh, to try to destroy the feminist script. Uh, womanism suggests that men and women will always be different. It suggests that it's good for men and women to be dependent on one another and form a community, the earlier the better uh, in most cases, because, uh, because that will allow them to learn how to struggle and grow together, which is what life is gonna demand. A, uh, a, a womanism would recognize that uh, sex is not like getting punched in the nose or like any other physical activity, but it suggests that it's a special and maybe even sacred human uh, act that uh, has special significance for both men and women. And, uh, and the, 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 the manners and laws that we have should try to cultivate the specialness, not to denigrate it. So in other words, womanism should fight against all three of the pillars as being under, undermining the grounds for human happiness. And, uh, and then on a, on a lower level, 
uh, on a policy level, I think that uh, a womanism policy would set for itself the goal of women being encouraged to take on part-time work. Obviously, circumstances have changed since the 1800s or the early 1900s with advances in technology and the advent of public schooling. And uh, the job of mothering and wifing is not as time consuming as it once was. It's clear that women have the capacities to engage in almost any profession. Um, you know, generally they don't do plumbing, but for whatever reason, uh, uh, but uh, so, so encouraging them to have lives that balance the various goods of independent work outside the home and cultivating community within the home, building a beautiful house and, uh, and nurturing great relationships among family life is something that I think, you know, the odds are about three out of four women would pursue that or prefer that uh, than would prefer a life of independent action. So uh, now there are various ways of promoting that policy goal, but I think that should be the goal of uh, conservatives who want to promote family life um, uh, in the face of feminism. It's not something that can be wished away. Feminism isn't something that can be wished away. It has to be dealt with uh, both intellectually and then worked around as a policy, um, but both at the same time uh, so that the workaround can be acceptable. So that's the slice of my book that's on feminism. And, uh, and I have other slices that if anyone would like to talk about, I'm perfectly happy to do it. But uh, thank you guys for your attention. And uh, now I'm opening up the fee court. Is that how I'm doing it? Or you guys are managing? Yes, thank you very much. That was great, Scott. <laughs> and um, let, let me start with a question. What, what you've done is uh, give us a, an open attack on feminism. And that is uh, something I think that's quite rare. Feminism isn't openly attacked. And it also isn't... Uh, openly promoted to any great extent. It, its importance, I think, in our lives is um, much uh, underestimated in our speech. So um, you know, wh what about this? It seems that men are afraid to attack feminism because that means that you're attacking women. And women, uh, a lot of the retail feminists that you speak of uh, wouldn't say that they're even feminists, much less retail feminists. So um, why this uh, avoidance of, um, of, of the word feminism? Communists, well, used, they were not, weren't embarrassed to call themselves communists. <laughs> but that doesn't seem to be the case here. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, I, I think that diagnosis is exactly right. Um, never has feminism been less talked about openly and never has it been more powerful as an ideology than it is now because it's worked its way into our institutions and our expectations of life. And, um, and one feels bad even talking to say an undergraduate, uh, which I, 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 this happens uh, when, when, they, when they ask me, uh, you know, do you think I should go to grad school? Do you think I should go to law school? And I ask them what their life was, they would like their life to be like when they're 40. And they usually say, well, I would like to be married and you know, I'd like to have a few kids. And I ask, well, how does that fit in with your aspirations to law school? And it's honestly a question that has never been asked <laughs> Um, and, uh, and, and I'm not their parent. Uh, so, uh, and I think that speaks to the power, and this is Idaho, this isn't uh, the coastal cities. Uh, this is where you have uh, uh, a generally more conservative population. You have a lot of Mormons, for instance, and, uh, and like they don't have that uh, preparation or that question isn't asked of them. So, um, so I think, we can only like make progress over the course of a generation if we begin to be self-conscious about how far feminism has worked its way into the education of both boys and girls. And, uh, and so what I try to do in the book, recognizing that it's not gonna be, uh, uh, it's, it's only an opening salvo, is to find compatriots uh, and have them be attracted to the book and contact me and build up a kind of, uh, uh, 
a bullpen of people who are willing to speak openly about the power that feminism has uh, in remaking our minds and uh, in shaping our lives. I don't think any progress can be made on it until uh, we have an open uh, diagnosis. And that's what I try to do, yeah. Do you think it's unwise? <laughs> no, no, but it's bold. <laughs> well, I have a loving wife and, uh, and so everything's good. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, you've just given the condition for bold. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions too, but first we have a question here in chat or two. Um, does Kate Millett and do other feminists say women should not be dependent on other women either? And is feminism fundamentally anti-capitalist? Um, all right, so that's both of those. Uh, so yes, I mean, I think Millett does how to put this, uh, I think Beauvoir is the one who talks about this most closely because she has a chapter in her second sex on the importance of lesbianism uh, for the future of feminism. Uh, but I think of that for her as part of the demand that no woman be dependent on any particular man. And I think that her expectation is that feminist li uh, lesbian liaisons aren't gonna be a long lasting um, aspect of most women's identity. Uh, I think it's part of leveraging women away from dependent relationships, which are mostly gonna be on men. Um, I don't know that any of them, I mean, they're all worried about monogamy and fidelity. Um, so if I take those two ideas, uh, I would have to say that they'd be worried about enduring lesbian relationships too though I don't ever remember anyone saying that. <laughs> so, uh, but I think that's where the principles uh, would necessarily lead. Is feminism necessarily anti-capitalism? Um, I think that uh, feminism is a stage in uh, the development of capitalism that might move beyond it. I think that's how the early feminists uh, really saw themselves. Uh, it could only come about. So it's kind of like feminism is kind of like Lenin's new economic program. Um, it's a moment of, of individualism that might be on the road to like abolishing all the modes of production. <laughs> and uh, certainly that's how Millet presents it. I mean, Millet's is the most, uh, not Millet, uh, Firestone. Firestone is the most radical of these thinkers. And she subordinates the current feminist mo movement in uh, underneath the socialist uh, uh, you know, view of the world. Uh, a moment before the actual abolition uh, of capital and the ending of the alienation of labor. That's how she sees it. Uh, and, and many of the others do the same. I don't know, I mean, you know, I think that there are real problems with the Marxist worldview. <laughs> and uh, and the, the most crucial is that, uh, that economics doesn't seem to be the driver of history and that history doesn't seem to have a driver. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and without that, I think feminism, uh, those particular feminists would have a difficult time, um, you know, justifying that conclusion. But short answer, for those early feminists, yes, uh, feminism is inconsistent with capitalism. And uh, it's just a question of whether or not that's true. Okay, let me try and, and formulate my first question. Um, uh, it, it'll come across as more aggressive than I mean it to be. Um, the, your, your view that the early feminists really set the framework, the most radical people set the framework and everybody else is just, um, you know, the, 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 the idiots who are fulfilling a radical idea that they're not even really aware of. I need more evidence for that than that there were a couple of people who wrote this radical stuff and um, then now everybody is working toward this goal because you know, I grew up in a small village. I knew a lot of people there and a lot of families and a lot of marriages. And I talked to my parents. Um, I don't recall happy marriages from, from that time in the 70s. And I was a very attuned, uh, astute kid. And there are grounds for this stuff, obviously. There are grounds for 
you know, the, the, the discontents of women and the expectations today are much higher. So of course the level of happiness is lower. The expectations were much lower back then. People were much more willing to settle. You can't have any of this back. So, but basically my question is, I need some evidence that we are really all working towards something completely radical and idiotic and unfulfillable rather than, you know, it's a little bit like Sweden where you say, we have policies that free up women and in the end they choose to work part time and, you know, raise their kids together. Yes. Um, so, so what kind of evidence would count? Um, and the, the kind of evidence that I've gathered for this is something like this. Um, do, do prominent feminist thinkers criticize Firestone and Millet for going as far as they did and if they do, on what grounds? And uh, now I haven't read every book written by a feminist. Um, I did a sampling of every book in the library, every 13th book I read, uh, the ch first chapter, and looked at the index. And I could, I could never find a sustained critic critique of Firestone and Millet by a feminist. So why not? I mean, uh, uh, in, in the case of Christians, for instance, who criticize the early arguments in favor of toleration, they like, well, I'm for toleration, but not if it can do it, not if it leads to indifference to religion. And, and, you know, there were sustained criticisms of those who made arguments for toleration. In the, in the case of feminism, I have been unable to identify sustained criticisms of the radical thinkers. Second, um, uh, the, the, the retail, as I call them, the retail, I don't want to say that they're idiots, but I want to call them under laborers. Can I call them that? Um, uh, the, the under laborers uh, also fail to identify uh, what the end point of their reforms would be. Um, and they think in today's language, but they don't think broadly about what the what the whole project is trying to accomplish. And um, and so, anyways, I mean, I think uh, those are the kinds of evidence that serve. Trouble uh, took. Are we? Oh, th those are the kinds of evidence that I try to uh, suggest that this is a bigger project. Um, than the retail feminists uh, recognize now. And, um, and you know, I mean, the, and, and one more thing on this, I mean, uh, there's a lot of evidence that prominent feminist thinkers seek the abolition of the family, both in the law and in the culture. And, uh, and they still articulate it. Uh, I, I talk about this in a different chapter, but some of the very prominent legal thinkers of feminism really argue uh, in favor of the abolition of the family in law and culture. I'm talking Martha, th these are more recent people, Linda McLean, Martha Feynman, uh, Teresa Metz. Uh, there's a couple of recent books uh, out on this. And, uh, and so as they're achieving many of their goals, the, the, like the, the next goal, the next big goal, I think is, uh, is coming up prominently. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a lead pipe cinch argument that I can give you here, um, but the, the kind of evidence that would refute me, I was unable to find. And uh, the kind of evidence that I would expect if it were true, I did find. So that's kind of, that's how I, that's how I make the argument. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll read a second question here in chat. Um, why have the working class been so affected, Trump supporters, as you refer to them, given that they seem to have resisted other ideas of intellectuals like socialism? Well, I think that, uh, that feminism is more American than socialism. <laughs> And, uh, and is more part of our daily lives and expectation and, and education than socialism is. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think that's why, I mean, I, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to, like I, what I would say is that the scripts that used to lead the working class, the laboring class in America to the life of an Archie Bunker, have been eliminated. 
And now when men and women don't know what to do, they end up not doing much. And that idea is more consistent with American freedom than something like socialism. So uh, this is a broad way of saying that feminism is way more in line with the grain of our regime and the grains of the, uh, you know, the, the American principles than other deleterious uh, political movements. And hence, uh, it's more difficult to fight uh, than those other political movements. Um, Jim, do you want to ask your question yourself or should I read it? I'm happy to read it. Why don't you read it? Okay. So maybe the best way to deal with the unwillingness to speak openly about feminists, mm. which just... Typo. <laughs> so, oops, there's a new question, sorry. Maybe the best way to deal with the unwillingness to speak openly about feminism, which just leads to cancellation for people and universities is to change the question. Maybe we should be having conversations on the best way for men and women to be happy. Is there a feminist way to happiness? And what is it? What must be sacrificed to get it? Yeah, so my point basically is that these feminist um, proposals are often made in an absolutist way and they should be transferred into a kind of prudential discourse in order for us to see what they involve. It's in a way like, like COVID, right? <laughs> that um, um, should we wear just one mask or two or maybe three or four? And eventually we're gonna choke uh, and not be able to breathe at all. But the experts would say, the experts weren't asked that question. The questions were asked, how can you reduce COVID transmission? So if the only goal of, of public policy is to, is to reduce COVID transmission, uh, then everything else has to be sacrificed. So if you have these absolutist demands by feminist activists, um, they are not, we're not putting this in a prudential um, discourse. We're not trying to, to balance one thing against another and ask what has to be sacrificed in order to get that. So if we, if we talk about what makes us happy, what we need to be happy, uh, and what makes some of us happy and not others of us happy, because many people are happy with family life and many people are not happy with family life. Um, I think we're gonna have a more constructive uh, discussion than by simply poking holes in uh, absolutist positions and then shooting people down who don't agree with us. Yes, no, thanks, Jim. I, I think I completely agree with that. And, um, and the arc of my book mirrors the thoughts that you have in there. That is the first thing I think that needs to be done is that the absolutist position of feminists need to be um, exposed. And then after that, we open up to what I call in the book, the new problem with, new, uh, with no name, which is the decline of character uh, that suits people for marriage. And therefore, and this is how the book ends, uh, for happiness. So I, I completely agree with that analysis. And that's, uh, it, it's just that feminism presents an obstacle um, to raising the prudential question. Um, it, uh, and, and the way I would say that is this, that uh, feminism promises independence and autonomy. It doesn't promise happiness. And therefore the fact that it makes people less happy isn't actually an argument against it. <laughs> and, uh, and, but it means that it's ignoring the most important human claim, or at least the, the most important human concern. And, uh, and therefore I would like to get to that concern, but it just need, it's necessary to kind of clear out uh, the ideology in order to make that, uh, that concern uh, seen and uh, ur the urgency of that concern seen. It's a political advantage to ask it, ask it in the prudential way since most people are in fact dependent and will always be dependent. Uh, whether they might want to be independent, but that's not gonna happen for most of the human race. And most people couldn't, couldn't give a fig for autonomy, even if they can define what autonomy is, but everybody cares about happiness. Mm -hmm. And when you raise the question, okay, what do you feminists want? And then what do I have to give up to get there? Happiness is a, is a complex algorithm. It's not a absolutist argument. And I think the more we talk about the algorithm, the less we talk about the, 
the, the statistics, so that's the wrong way of putting it, the best we talk about, about uh, means and, and ends, uh, the better off we are. Yeah. I think people, yeah, they have some questions that veer in the direction of economics too. So here's Shep Melnick's question. Um, follow up to Bernard Trout's question, the decline of marriage and to be blunt, poor child rearing is more prominent among those who are least exposed to and least receptive to feminist theories. The former working class, those without a college degree, Trump voters, however you want to put it. Uh -huh. In contrast, college educated men and women, as you point out, have much stronger marriages and devote enormous time, effort and resources to child rearing. How would you explain this contrast? Yeah, I mean, I I explain the contrast through the through the the decline of one idea of marriage and the rise of a different idea of marriage, um, and uh, in my talk I called that the decline of the foundational idea of marriage and the rise of the capstone idea of marriage. Now I think it's it's surprising, and it's not something that anyone would have predicted that upper class marriages would be as stable have fewer divorces as, uh, yeah, as they are today. If you would have asked anyone in the 1970s, it looks like to me, I mean, I was eight, um, but uh, it looks to me like they would have expected the upper class to be the vanguard of the revolution. That is the most strident advocates for open marriage uh, and not marrying. And uh, so it is a great surprise that it is not like that, and that the upper class actually uh, pr practices what uh, Putnam, Robert Putnam called neo-traditional marriages, which is uh, they start later, there's a lot of sex beforehand, both of them are working, but they're stable. And, uh, and the men and women do pretty much the roles that they would have done uh, under previous regimes. So I think it's a total surprise that that happened and, uh, and and I explain it by uh, it being later uh, and each person being much more independent and the merit, the expectations of what you're gonna get out of marriage uh, seem to be uh, more reconcilable to the idea of independence. The people who required the script, um, that's the lower class. And though they are less, um, uh, subject to the whims of ideology, they are subject to the culture that destroys the idea that men and women should have distinct roles and, uh, in, in life. And um, they're increasingly skeptical of religion, which also teaches those, uh, those things. I mean, in, in the case of every, every religion, really. So, um, so as religious practice has declined among the lower class and as jobs have left uh, the lower class, the idea that men should be providers and women uh, should be somewhat domestic has been stigmatized and, uh, and they have a difficult time, uh, more difficult time living a common life. I think the lower class expectation is the one that has been more fulfilled. The upper class thing is, uh, is a surprise and can only be explained by the changing nature of marriage itself. Tom Palmer, please. Hi, just quickly in answer to one of those earlier questions, I just seems to me that feminism is popularly associated with uh, equality. E e e and you, you, know, you wanna be against racism and so you wanna be for equality among the sexes. I wondered if you ran across, I'm sure you did, um, Andrea Dworkin who was sort of a charismatic person, but has been gone from the scene for a while. And then I wondered if you'd just name a, one or two non-male critics of feminism that you that might agree with a lot of what you write. Thank you. Yeah, um, so I think that the best, uh, the best critic of feminism, but, but you're limiting me to women. So was Midge Dechter. Uh, her book was called, uh, it was in the early 70s, maybe 1972, it was called The New Chastity and Other Arguments Against Women's Liberation. Um, I have an article about that book that is coming out or maybe it's already come out in modern age. Um, uh, and I think that's a, it's a really fantastic book. And, you know, I mean, I've gone back and read a couple of Phyllis Schlafly's books and uh, have been like suitably impressed with how serious she was 
especially early before uh, she was more activism. Uh, and then the other one is the book, and I think this is the finest book, um, is by, is her name Carolyn Graglia? It's called Domestic Tranquility. Um, it was written in the late 90s. Spence Publishing published it. It is fantastic. That book is fantastic. Um, and, uh, and very, uh, very underappreciated. Um, a deep, deep meditation on what it means to be a woman. Uh, so I learned a lot about uh, what it means to be a good husband. I was only, mar I got married in 1993. So I was only married a few years and we were just having kids when I read that. And I was like, oh, that's good that I'm reading this. I might do a better job because of that. So um, it's a really fantastic book. But I think the best book is Sexual Suicide by George Gilder. Um, quick follow up, um, the, the book Domestic Tranquility, um, how many people would actually be able to, I don't know anything about it, how many people would actually be able to read it, understand it and apply it, have the resources, both the intellectual, the constitutional, virtuous, economic resources to live that way? Um, oh, I, I get what you're, I get what you're asking. I thought you were going to ask something else. I get it. Um, uh, I think- uh, Are you making assumptions of what women ask you? <laughs> no, I, I, I just miss her. I, I was, a, uh, I, I get questions from students and I start thinking of students instead of uh, good ones like that. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say that the answer is three out of four. Uh, three out of four human beings are suited for married life. And, uh, and one out of four women, I think, aren't. And, uh, and that it's very difficult to find a social teaching that can satisfy both of that, those groups. And, uh, but I do think that that's about the breakdown. Um, and my evidence for that breakdown, insofar as that is asked for, is that uh, surveys really around the world about part-time work suggest that three out of four women prefer it. And three out of four women would not like to be working when they have children under 18. Whereas one out of four are happy to do it. And, uh, and so that's kind of where I get, uh, get that number. Um, uh, yeah, that's good. Um, thank you. Uh, Kenneth Lassen, please. Unmute. Uh, yes, uh, do you have any thoughts about Catherine McKinnon? Yes. <laughs> okay. uh, I, I asked that because I, you, you asked if anybody has been involved in this. I've been involved in this for a long time. I'm a law professor at the University of Baltimore School of Law. And some time ago, I wrote a, a piece in the Journal of Legal Education entitled Feminism Awry, Excesses at the Pursuit of Rights and Trifles, uh, in which I, uh, I kind of took to uh, account and took to task Catherine McKinnon and um, uh, she uh, responded uh, in the Journal of Legal Education, and then I responded back. So that was a good, uh, that was back in 1992. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering uh, if, uh, if, she's, uh, if she's ever taken you on. No, um, I, uh, I, I'm small fish. I'm small fish here. Um, uh, I, I write about her in my section on, uh, on rape and harassment law. I think it's in chapter 10. Um, and obviously that's what she's most known for. And that reminds me of another book that's good by a woman. Darn it. Um, uh, Daphne, uh, her last name is escaping my mind right now. The, the name of the book is Heterophobia. She teaches at Boston University. And uh, her first name is Daphne, and then there's a last name, and it's called heterophobia. But uh, so ba back to back to Catherine McKinnon. Yeah, I mean she's known for the the idea that under condition. Yes, Patai. Patai. thank you. There you go. Yes, uh, I would love to meet her, and uh, sometime I'm gonna go out there just to have a pilgrimage of sorts, because um, it's a, that's a very good book, and it's about McKinnon, um, and uh, and but broadly it's about how to. Uh, we brought women into the workplace and that's fine. Uh, now the, the question is how are men and women gonna get along in the workplace? And the lens through which uh, workplace relations are understood by McKinnon 
is through the har sexual harassment lens. And, um, and, and what, what uh, Patai does in that book is try to show that uh, like that makes assumptions about men and about women that aren't true. <laughs> and, uh, and therefore we need a different lens and uh, to, to understand the relation between men and women. It's something that we've just assumed either that the, the model for men and women working together will be sexual harassment, or we've assumed that it'll just be easy. And, uh, and she argues against both those positions and, uh, and tries, to, tries to find ways of accommodating the various tendencies of men and women in the workplace. So I, I think attacking, McKinnon is another example of one of the radical thinkers who's pretty, uh, pretty out there because under, under conditions of patriarchy, which she says are all human societies, even ours today, there's no such thing as relations between men and women that aren't based on power. And, uh, and she says, you can't have consensual sex in these relationships and all sex is rape. And these are things she's known for. And uh, the relations between men and women in the workplace are always harassment. So um, yes, I mean, I, she, she has not attacked me, but I would love it. You know, I just, uh, it would make me feel alive if it happened. So Ken, I, I'm sure that's the way you felt. Yeah, well, uh, actually when she, had, uh, when she attacked me in print, uh, I viewed that as a, a highlight of my academic career, uh, which might not say much about my academic career, but um, uh, when I, her, her most famous work was Feminism Unmodified. And when I, when I tried to attack that, I, uh, I said, uh, uh, here and after F you. And uh, I don't think she, uh, she appreciated that. So, uh, but I did. Um, there, if there are no questions from the audience right now, I, we can always ask more. I have a ton of questions and so do you. What about the economic uh, situation in the US, Scott? How much would change or have to change for women to be able to work part-time? Would there have to be um, government program support? Um, you know, Sweden is the, the example that in some sense contradicts you, I think a little bit, um, very progressive country where women are more feminine or more in line with what you think than here. So it didn't seem to have ruined families there to the same degree. So what would have to happen um, economically and what would happen to like the US economic output or you know relative standing if a lot of women said you know what bye um so i i haven't seen recently the stats on sweden um uh there there was and 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 I, I remember the articles that it's in but it was really a high percentage of women with children work part time in sweden um and i mean the, the number was like above 40% for sure and, uh, but it, it may have been higher. I just, I, it, uh, I, I can't remember right now. Um, so, but, but that's not really the, the question. Uh, the question is like, how physically can this be done? Because Sweden does that through government support for part-time work so that there's a kind of family allowance uh, for it. And, uh, and it looks like places like Hungary are doing something very similar to that now. And uh, to some effect, uh, that is, you know, it seems to have reversed their declines in birth rates and such. And uh, so obviously that's one way it can be done through public aid. Another way that can be done is through breaking up jobs. Um, and by breaking up jobs, I mean, for instance, like teachers and nurses working part-time instead of full-time uh, while they have children and finding ways to job share and, uh, and putting incentives in place for places to do that. I don't think America will have a labor shortage if that happens. And in fact, I think, uh, this is my theory on it at least, uh, this works out as a supply and demand matter, but I don't know if it'll work out in practice, uh, that the fewer hours women work, and if the number of hours demanded remains constant, it would be the more hours men work. And, uh, and that would generally be good for wages, uh, lower class, up, uh, middle class wages, so I think by taking a lot of hours off the table, uh, we could find ways of creating actual um, uh, more demands for male provision and responsibility. That's a theory though. I'll have econ economists check it. Patrick Dowdell, please. Patrick? Okay, I got unmuted here. 
Um, I guess first I have a, uh, an observation and then a question. My observation is that it seems to me that your view of this foundational marriage is somewhat Pollyannish. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a uh, state next to yours, Montana, in a uh, kind of a working class town. And frankly, I can't think of many marriages that uh, uh, I thought were happy. Uh, this, I think, also was accompanied by a high degree of alcoholism uh, among men. Uh, people I've talked to who have grown up at the same time in, say, New York suburban uh, uh, areas talk about the intense unhappiness of uh, women, uh, the, you know, the wives who were at home, uh, which, again, there is a reasonable amount of uh, alcoholism. And, uh, and a lot of depression. So I'm not certain that that was such a, uh, a great model. And that'd be interesting in your, in your response to that. The other point is I wanna get back to the lower uh, income. Um, and it seems to me that you know, when you talk about the men and, the, you know, and, and not the responsibility and not moving towards marriage, back 50 years ago, they all had readily available jobs. You know, this was the industrial America. And again, it was an industrial type of town where I grew up in, you know, people, they graduated from high school and they went and worked uh, on the hill as they uh, uh, described it. And then that just kind of led to other things. Now you don't have that. So if the jobs that uh, they go to are really not great jobs, they're not going to uh, provide. And uh, it, it seems to me that this change in the uh, economic structure of, uh, uh, of America has had a lot to do uh, with this. So anyway, a comment and uh, a, a question. Yeah, all right. So first on the comment, I'm pretty sure, but I'm not, uh, I'm not 100% sure that if you looked at alcohol rates, alcoholism rates and drug use rates in rural areas like what you're talking about in Montana, and I'm gonna guess it's kind of similar to Idaho, um, that it would be three times as worse now uh, than it was uh, back in the day. Um, that's, all, that, that's what the statistics show. And it's true for the suburban women you're talking about too. Um, the, one of the arguments that Ferdan used in the, in the Feminine Mystique is that a lot of women are on what she called tranquilizers because of the uh, restlessness that they feel and sense and the meaningless of their meaninglessness of their lives. But the rates of using those things are triple, quadruple what they were in the 50s. So, um, uh, so I think you know, that, uh, that we can both idealize the past, that we can de-idealize the past. And, uh, and I just try to say, uh, so that, that's my reading of, uh, of that particular thing. And I, I, I agree on, on the second point, the economic point. Um, and I, I think it's a chicken and egg problem because, uh, because uh, I mean, obviously without jobs, men can't provide. Um, but on the other hand, uh, without uh, marriages, men don't have a reason to provide. So there are a lot of different ways to find work. Um, and, uh, and it's difficult, uh, uh, it's difficult to find meaning in the work unless it's serving something greater than yourself. And, uh, so I think that both elements of it are, end up being important. Um, and, uh, and when we look at it strictly from the economic point of view, I think we should do what we can to bring back manufacturing jobs and such. Um, and, uh, but, but that in itself won't uh, revive anything unless accompanying that is the idea that that's a responsibility. Um, so we have a question from the audience. In so far as feminism is in harmony with our regime's fundamental principles, as you say, equality, freedom, independence, um, or is even an unfolding of these principles can it really ultimately be overcome? Uh, uh, it puts big obstacles into overcoming it, doesn't it? Um, and uh, and I, I think it can be overcome, but it just might be 
that as it's overcome, the regime will itself change. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and what I would say there is that I think ultimately feminism is going to be a contributing factor, a big time contributing factor to the decline of uh, the American idea and the American nation. And, uh, and in its place will come something that, uh, that is more consistent with the full range of human aspirations. So I do think that this is a regime level question. And, uh, and it's a, uh, any, any pushback against uh, feminism is what I call in the introduction of the book, uh, seeking to establish a mixed regime, to reestablish a mixed regime. And, uh, and it's very difficult once a certain kind of momentum gets rolling um, toward you know, a purer and purer regime to roll it back. And, uh, but that's like, I think that's what's necessary to stave off the decline of the country. How's that? <laughs> Got a lot of work cut out for you. <laughs> well, uh, here's one more question. Um, uh, a feature of your book is uh, is uh, your use of the term uh, liberal wing ringer, ringing, and uh, with a W. So, um, and then I wondered if, if you could explain that. You illustrate it with the confrontation uh, between John Rawls and uh, Susan Oaken, who happens to be uh, somebody I remember. She uh, was a graduate student in the Department of Government, got her PhD uh, with a dissertation that was the basis for her later book on women in Western political thought. So I remember her very well, and of course Rawls, Rawls too. But maybe you could uh, say something about that. Yeah. Um well, yeah, those are those are two separate things. Um, so, you know, Rawls is the uh, is the the founder of contemporary liberalism, and he said that we uh, that a just political community would remake every fundamental institution in light of the idea that uh, that. Uh, that the people who were making it were behind the veil of ignorance. That is that they wouldn't know anything about their identity. And, uh, and Rawls then went to build a welfare state and to justify the idea that the state would be neutral on moral controversies so that everyone who had a different kind of religion could follow their religion. Everyone had a different kind of lifestyle could pr pursue their lifestyle. They would have sufficient support and no laws uh, getting in their way. But Rawls in theory of justice called the family a foundational institution but did not go about remaking it. And uh, he just let it sit there. And uh, Oaken's critique of Rawls was that if you're gonna remake all the fundamental institutions, you have to make sure that the family is remade so that there'll be no expectation for what men and women will be like within family. And in fact, you have to use the state to break down the previous ideas of what men and women should be like uh, in order to achieve a neutral family life. And, uh, and she articulated that in her, uh, her book, late eighties, right? Justice, uh, gender and the family. And uh, Rawls uh, conceded the point uh, and said, oops, forgot that one. And, uh, and he went and uh, in, in the last book and some of his uh, uh, you know, essays that came out before that said, yeah, we need to go after the family and uh, remake it in terms of gender neutrality. The only stipulation was that the family still needed to be able to do its job, which was raise children, um, but, uh, but it needed to do it in a gender neutral way. Um, and uh, if that meant compensating mothers, that that's what they would do, or if that meant national daycare, that's what we'd have to do. So um, yeah, the, the, the early theory of justice is like, kind of respond, um, from my perspective, kind of responsible on the family. It says we can remake public life, but we, it's, we shouldn't go about trying to remake private life. But in the light, in the, in the face of the feminist critique, Rawls conceded the point and, uh, and let the feminist kind of run with his framework from that point on. The other thing, the liberal ringer, um, the liberal ringer is uh, how no morals legislation can survive the analysis that the Supreme Court or liberal thought gives to it. There can never be sufficient justification for restriction on individual liberty 
that serves uh, like shaping human passions and desires toward family life. So uh, uh, there are certain arguments that the liberals use to, to get rid of every aspect of, uh, of morals regulation. That's what I call the liberal ringer. Um, they squeeze the morality out of every law, but what that really means is that they pro promote a different morality in every law. They ask questions like, and here I'm like searching my memory for these questions well, um, is this re regulation absolutely necessary to achieve that goal? Or is there some other way to achieve that goal? If polygamy sometimes leads to like preying on underage women, that doesn't mean we should proscribe polygamy. It means we should increase our laws against preying on younger women and, uh, and, and regulate it in that way so that the law can never be sufficiently tailored narrowly in order to get the uh, to get at the behavior that the law is seeking to uh, to eliminate, that's an example of the liberal ringer. Um, and you know, uh, another example, uh, you know, uh, in using polygamy is the uh, it, it is the example is that America has always proscribed polygamy because it's connected with patriarchal politics. But perhaps there could be a new kind of polygamy that isn't connected to patriarchal politics and revealed religion. We'll call it a postmodern polygamy. So that the thing that we're trying to eliminate isn't essential to the polygamist uh, uh, point of view. There could be a polygamist point of view that is uh, consistent with liberty, equality, and consent. And, and when you ask these questions, you realize uh, it, you, you know marijuana debates, polygamy debates, pornography debates, the same arguments come up over and over again with the same result. And uh, the, 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 the gun is put to the head of morals legislation and it is demand, they demand a reason and there's never sufficient reason to, uh, to sustain that, leg that legislation. So if conservatives fight on that ground, it's a loss <laughs> and uh, the, the ground has to be changed. All right. So we have time for one more question. Um, there was uh, Amy who had raised her hand before. Maybe she has left. No, I'm here. I'm still here. Uh, I didn't know that you still had time. So I, I want to uh, applaud you for your efforts. I agree with you that uh, feminism is really one of the most corrosive isms that we have in our society. So, and, and it's a difficult problem. I, want, I just want to raise the possibility of another regime level question, and that's the pursuit of happiness and the, the emphasis that you put on um, making women happy, which I think is a difficult task. <laughs> and, uh, and just the, what about emphasizing instead um, JFK's question, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, that every, things are required of citizens and all of us have to contribute and we should be thinking about how not so much, because we don't go around asking what's gonna make men happy constantly, <laughs> obviously. And maybe there could be more attention to that as well to offset the, this extreme emphasis on women's desires that we've, we've this sort of accepted recently. Yeah, well, I would be all for re, uh, raising that question and making it central um, uh, to, to, to the way we approach it. Now, the. The Kennedy quote, um, I'm, I'm trying to like, I think Milt Fried, Milton Friedman began his uh, Capitalism and Freedom book with a criticism of uh, John, John F. Kennedy's speech and, uh, and said it was a recipe for collectivism um, as if the citizens were the wards of the state and the state owned the citizen. And uh, I think that goes too far because I think it wasn't necessarily about that, but um, you know, I think the first stage in defending uh, both, you know, what makes women happy and what makes men happy and making marriage more central to that is a, a re-adoption of the idea that there are private and public. And uh, now I think that ultimately that distinction kind of breaks down and isn't true. Um, but the idea that men and women can make different choices is because they're consulting their own private consciences, their own education, their own preparation for life. And, uh, and so uh, uh, making fewer demands on what we expect women to be like 
um, I think would be one of the things that would cultivate more feminine happiness. <laughs> um, because I think the, the voice of nature and their own passions would be more easily heard if there was less feminist indoctrination. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of where I would go on that. Thank you for that. With that statement, <laughs> feminist indoctrination, you've been very generously bold with your remarks today, and we thank you for them, Scott Yenner. Thank yes, you for having me. Got, here's the last comment. Somebody says, um, a free classroom discussion guide for Scott Yenner's book is available at yenorbook.com. So maybe you were too modest to mention it. <laughs> Masculine modesty. <laughs> well, thank you for thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>